Thanks for, you know, making me feel welcome and teaching me about all of those things. So let's see what's going to happen tonight. A new spirit, it is clear, is abroad among America's youth. Beginning with the Occupy movement in 2011, gathering additional force with the emergence of Black Lives Matter in 2014, and redoubling itself yet again after the election of Donald Trump, a zeal for activism and social justice unseen since the early 1970s has taken hold on campus and beyond. Ask a college student what they hope to do with their lives, and the answer is apt to be some version of have an impact, change things for the better, or make the world a better place. Now, I think your generation, I mean you young people, you students, is, is to be commended for this. It, it certainly marks a radical improvement over my own. Ronald Reagan was elected president my senior year of high school. Of my six best friends, three were proud conservatives, members of, as people called them then, the, the Reagan youth. My years in college saw the beginning of the rush on elite private campuses to Wall Street and consulting. In, uh, one factoid, in 1983, 40% of Princeton seniors applied for jobs at First Boston. Just one bank, 40%. And of course, others applied to others, and at other col colleges they applied to others. Uh, greed was good, to quote a, tag of, a, tag, a catchphrase of the period. Idealism was for suckers, and the 60s were dead and buried. It was the beginning of a great depoliticization of American youth that lasted for 30 years. And let me circle back and say, it's not that my, half of my friends were Reagan Republicans. It's that what that was about was, it was about depoliticization. It was about a disdain for any kind of political idealism. Um, so it wasn't like you, you went and then like worked for a conservative senator or something. It's like you, well, greed was good. That's where you went. So good for you guys, more power to you. But there is one important thing that seems to me conspicuously missing from today's impulse to show silly meaningful action. And to explain what it is uh, and why it matters, I want to start by quoting a passage from an essay by uh, David Nidorf, who's the president of Deep Springs College. I don't know if you know about Deep Springs, but we can talk about it later. Um, and it's an exchange that Nidorf had with an eight-year-old, he reports having had with an eight-year-old boy. Um, uh, I guess they were, he didn't say this, but I guess they were been talking about philosophy. The philosophers in the room are going to like this. And I guess the boy uh, wanted him to explain like what that means. So Nidorf says, well, here's a philosophy question for you. What makes a person good? And the boy says, oh, that's an easy one. A good person is somebody who helps other people. And Nidorf says, really? So what does a good person help other people to do? And the boy says, whatever they're trying to do. And Nidorf says, do they help people do anything they want to do, no matter what it is? And the boy says, well, no, I guess not. So Nidorf says, OK, so out of all the things that people try to do, which one does a good person help them to do? And the boy says, oh, that's easy. He helps them to do things that are good. <laughs> You've signaled by your laughter that you recognize, as Nidorf notes, the child himself did immediately. Uh, that the exchange turned out to be circular. Nadarov also comments that it reproduces the opening of Plato's Republic. Good people are good are people who help other people do good, which means that the good has been defined in terms of itself, which means that it hasn't been defined at all, which is why it's a circular exchange. Now, the relevance of, your, of this dialogue to your generational project, and no doubt to your personal project, becomes apparent as soon as we reflect that the concept of the good is embedded in the word that lies at the heart of your collective and individual self-definition, which is to say better, to change things for the better, to make the world a better place. Well, better means more good. So the question arises, what is good? And the answer, as our eight-year-old boy discovered, is not as easy as it seems. The problem of the good is one of those questions that is likely to make you realize when you start to think about it that you've never really have thought about it, uh, that you've simply taken the answer for granted. And it might even make you realize that you don't even know how to think about it. One of the problems with the concept of the good, one of the challenges it forces on us, Nidorf goes on to note, is that it points to what he calls real and competing ends. As the philosopher Isaiah Berlin has argued, the characteristic ideals of liberal society, freedom, equality, justice, are to some degree irreconcilably in conflict. Freedom often leads to inequality. 
Equality often demands the diminishment of freedom. As it happens, that conflict is vividly apparent in perhaps the most important debate taking place on campuses today. I don't need to explain this to you. The struggle over restrictions on offensive speech. One side talks about freedom of expression, the other about the need to, con to create an environment in which all feel able to participate as equals. But that's just an example, actually, a, a particularly pertinent example that might come back later. But the same kinds of dilemmas, in general, arise in society as a whole. The same kinds of difficult, ongoing, sometimes irreducible conflicts between competing ends. And even to say that is already to assume that we have satisfying de definitions for each of those ends in themselves. That we know what we mean when we speak about freedom, equality, justice, the last of which is indeed the subject of Plato's Republic, a book that runs to about 400 pages in English translation, and which, at the end of which many people have long felt a satisfying answer still hasn't been given. <laughs> Freedom, equality, justice, beauty, truth, happiness, prosperity, success, what do we mean by these things? It's easy to know what you're against. It's a lot harder to come up with any kind of specific idea as to what you want to put in its place with, that is, a coherent vision of the social good rather than a bundle of slogans like overthrowing the patriarchy or dismantling hierarchies of power. Or maybe it's actually not even that easy to know what you're against. I often hear people in many contexts declare their opposition to capitalism. But the way they use the term suggests that they don't really know what capitalism means. They appear to equate it with greed or inequality or markets or money, or having to work, all of which predate the emergence of capitalism by thousands of years and have been features of most, if not all, human societies since the agricultural revolution. Nor do I hear many clear ideas, or really many ideas at all, as to what we should put in its place. If you don't want capitalism, which I, I would define briefly as involving the private ownership of production, the free market distribution of goods, and the cycle of investment and profit, then what do you want? I'm not asking that as a rhetorical question. I really want to know, what do you want? Do you want state control of the economy, centralized planning, perhaps small-scale collectivism? Again, these are not rhetorical questions. These are the kinds of questions that need to be addressed if you really do want to bring about the end of capitalism. But again, that's just an example, an important example, but just an example. The larger point is that when you commit yourself to the good, to making the world a better place, you need to commit yourself first, not to action at all, but to something else, something that has to precede it, to reflection, contemplation, analysis, study, in a word, to thought. But that is precisely what I find lacking today in progressive circles no less than anywhere else, not just on campuses, but everywhere. Nobody wants to think. Certainly, nobody wants to think about their own beliefs, values, and assumptions. Now, this has always been a problem everywhere. No one ever wants to think about their beliefs, values, and assumptions. It's too much trouble, and it's much too troubling. And after all, Asking people to think about their beliefs, values, and assumptions is exactly what Socrates, Plato's teacher, went around asking people in Athens to do until they said, here, drink this hemlock. <laughs> but I do think that it has become especially acute today, particularly for young people, more particularly for progressive college students, and most particularly for progressive students at elite private colleges. In other words, for people exactly like you. That's because we live at a time when progressive opinion has hardened into something approaching religious dogma. There's a right way to think, and a right way to talk, and a right set of things to think and talk about. So secularism is taken for granted. Environmentalism is treated as a sacred cause. Issues of identity, principally the holy trinity of race, gender, and sexuality, occupy the center of the discourse. The assumption on the left is that we are already in full possession of the moral truth. We already know what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong. 
there really is nothing to discuss except how to put our beliefs into practice. Dogma makes for, or perhaps is defined as, ideological consensus, and consensus is enforced by social means, most obviously today through social media. I'm sure I don't need to explain this to you, this has already come up a couple of times today. But also, the tighter a social environment is, the stronger and more stultifying its consensus is likely to be. High schools tend to be such environments, but at least in high school, unless you're at boarding school, you get to go home at the end of the day. Colleges in that respect are even worse. They are, as sociologists call such things, total institutions. Places that subsume the totality of their members' lives, like prisons, monasteries, mental hospitals, or the military, for rough analogies for college. The social cost of dissent is correspondingly higher. The progressive ideological cons consensus is correspondingly tighter. I'm sure I don't need to explain this to you either. In fact, I should probably just skip this paragraph given everything I've heard today. So maybe I am. I mean, it's a paragraph about things that I've seen at other campuses. Uh, the one thing I will say is that one thing you hear is that if you, if you challenge the reigning dogma, you will get branded as a racist, as in, don't talk to that guy, he's a racist. As for why things are worse at elite private colleges even than they are at other schools, that's because they are so homogenous in social terms. I think this came up earlier in the day. Their students largely come, well, they talk about barbell demographics, so they're two lumps, although they're not lumps of equal size. Their student populations largely come from the liberal upper and upper middle classes, multiracial but predominantly white, or white and Asian, really, with an admixture of lower income students of color, that's the second half of the barbell, but the two demographics have broadly similar political and ideological beliefs, as evidenced by the fact that they together more or less constitute the Democratic Party base. So the communities of origin of students at elite private colleges, mainly affluent suburbs and upscale urban enclaves, already tend to share the liberal consensus. And so do the private or well-resourced, might as well be private, public high schools from which those students tend to come. Uh, and in case you don't know this, I went and I looked it up. Williams isn't quite one of those three dozen or so colleges where there are more students from the top 1% than from the bottom 60%, but it's close. 18.1 from the top 1%, 19.6 from the bottom 60%. Okay, 18% from the top 1%. Which means, if you do the math, that your chances of getting into Williams if you grow up in the top 1% are 55 times better than if you grew up in the bottom 60%. Um, now, all these things actually were better in the 80s. There weren't a lot of things that were better in the 80s. It was really quite horrible. <laughs> but communities were not as ideological homog ideologically homogenous then, and neither were young people, not even young people who went to fancy private colleges. As I said, almost half of my friend group, and they all went to fancy private colleges, in high school were conservatives. There was no consensus, no groupthink, no getting away from radically different positions, no avoiding having to mount a cogent response. You couldn't not talk to that guy. Even within the left, at a time when Marxist ideas and ideologies were still important elements of the intellectual climate, and I mean people who had actually read Marx and the Marxists, not just people who called themselves Marxists, um, uh, so because of that, a wide range of disagreement prevailed, as I saw when I got to college. Uh, I think I just lost some light there. It'd be nice to get it back. Um, Trotsk Trotskyites argued with Social Democrats. Maoists argued with Leninists. I mean, people ran around calling themselves these things. Trade union liberals with anarcho-syndicalists. Reformists with revolutionaries because we had to defend our positions against vigorous and regular assaults, we couldn't, which couldn't simply be stigmatized and dismissed, we were forced to think them through. Now, none of this is to praise, to idealize or even praise the students of my generation. I mean, we, we really were quite a bunch of little stinkers, 
And the Marxists in particular were totally obnoxious. The last thing you wanted to be do is trapped into a conversation with, with a Marxist. But if you were, you know, you just had to let them grind away at you uh, and realize that you couldn't defend your position, <laughs> which sucks. <laughs> and the truth is we arrived in college, this is certain of ourselves, as you guys did, or indeed as any bunch of 18-year-olds ever does. But there was another difference too. There was a difference in the prevailing idea about what college was for. Today, the idea is that the purpose of college is to equip you, equip you with the tools to go out and pursue your goals. Now, mainly this has nothing to do with ideology one way or the other. Mainly the prevailing idea of college is that its exclusive purpose is to equip you for success in the labor market. And if this were a different kind of talk, that's the direction I would go in and we talk about that and I talk about it in my book and so forth. But, but let's leave that aside, the vocational idea of college and all that it implies. Even when the idea of college is understood in higher terms, often couched in words like leadership or service or phrases like giving back or making a contribution or indeed building a better world, all these things that would seem to be antithetical to just like running off to Wall Street and making a lot of money. Underneath that stark difference or, or antimony or antithesis, a common root, the same approach, college as the place where you acquire the tools to pursue your goals, where you study environmental engineering or global public health or gender theory, where you develop practical skills like communication and problem solving and what they now call critical thinking, but not where you question those goals, where you question the ends to which those tools and skills are supposed to be put, not where you take the risk of coming out a radically different person from the one who went in, someone with very different beliefs, values, and assumptions. Now that is my conception of college an older conception of college. It's not the only conception of college that used to exist, but it was a very important one. College is the place that teaches you precisely how to think, that teaches you to think, that forces you to approach and shows you how to approach those fundamental questions that I started by talking about. What is the good? What are freedom, equality, and justice? Beauty, truth, happiness, success, what do I care about? What do I want? And your fundamental job as students is to take those questions on. We might say that before you can, un you, before you can learn, you have to unlearn. You don't arrive in college a blank slate. You arrive having already been inscribed with all the ways of thinking and feeling that the world has been instilling in you from the moment you were born. The myths, the narratives, the pieties, the sacred words. As Ellen Bloom said, your soul is a mirror of what is around you. I always noticed as a teacher or freshman that my students could be counted on to produce an opinion on any given subject the moment I, I introduced it, which, uh, which was remarkable to me because it seemed like they had thought about everything. Uh, but then I realized that it was actually more like their minds were like a chemical bath of conventional attitudes that would instantly precipitate out of solution and form kind of a hard, impenetrable shell around any subject, any object you introduced. Uh, and let me say that I've also noticed that this is not confined to 18-year-olds. <laughs> we might also say that society, to sound a little too lofty here, is a conspiracy to keep itself from the truth. We pass our lives submerged in propaganda, advertising messages, political rhetoric, the journalistic affirmation of the status quo, the platitudes of popular culture, the axioms of party, sect, and class, the bromides we exchange every day on Facebook, the comforting lies our, our parents tell us, and the sociable ones our friends do, the steady stream of falsehoods that we each tell ourselves all the time, 
to stave off the threat of self-knowledge. The philosophers here will tell you that Plato referred to this ball of attitudes and opinions as doxa, which is where we get words like orthodox or heterodox. And it's important to recognize that it is just as powerful a force among progressives as among conservatives in Williamstown as in Mississippi for atheists as for fundamentalists. And we might say, this is really just a trick of, of words, it's not etymologically correct, but we might say that the central purpose of a liberal education is to liberate us from doxa by teaching us to recognize it, to question it, and to think our way around it. One of my favorite writers on higher ed is an English professor at UVA named Mark Edmondson, and he's got a wonderful book called Teacher. It's actually about a teacher he had as a senior in high school uh, who had just come out of college and who had studied a lot of philosophy and who put Socrates' methods to, uh, to work at this uh, working class high school in uh, suburban Boston. Uh, in other words, he echoed his students' opinions back to them or forced them to articulate them for themselves. That's all he did. A and by dragging them into the light, by asking you to defend them or just acknowledge having them, he began to break them down, to expose them to the operations of we what we can call the critical intelligence and thus to develop that intelligence in the first place. The point was not to replace his students' opinions with his own. The point was to bring them into the unfamiliar, uncomfortable, and endlessly fertile condition of doubt. He was teaching them not what to think, but how. If you find yourself in a classroom where a teacher is trying to teach you what to think, I suggest you find the closest exit. Because that is a professor's role, to make you think with rigor, precisely, patiently, responsibly, remorselessly, and not only, as my own professor Carl Krober once wrote, about your deepest ingrained presuppositions, which is what I've been talking about, but he said, also about your most exhilarating new insights, most of which turn out to be fallacious. You want some people in your life whose job it is to tell you when you're wrong. Indeed, it's been said that the purpose of college is to teach you how to be wrong, to teach you when and why to change your mind. Now, I used that phrase liberal arts a few minutes ago. I want to expand on what it means. People throw it around all the time. They often don't know what it means. Sometimes even when they're presidents of liberal arts colleges. They have, uh, liberal arts have nothing to do with liberalism and has nothing to do with arts. So it's, it's not the best phrase. They also don't mean all the things that your parents wish you wouldn't study. <laughs> they're often equated with the humanities, but while they include the humanities, they also include the sciences and social sciences. The liberal arts are those disciplines in which the pursuit of knowledge is, uh, uh, is conducted for its own sake. That's, that's it's not my definition, that's the, de that's the traditional definition, I think it's a good definition. Which means that when you study the liberal arts, you don't study a body of material. Uh, you learn, you know, I mean that may come along with it, but it's, what, what you actually learn is how knowledge is created. You don't acquire information, you debate it. How do we know it's true? How is it established? What further questions does it raise? What are the premises that underlie the discipline as a whole? Let's not keep those premises out of sight, whether it's biology or American studies or whatever. You learn, in other words, despite the fact that we live in the age of information, that there is no such thing as information, strictly speaking. There are only arguments. Every fact, I would say everything you know that you don't know through direct experience, and I guess you could even make an argument that those things that you do know through direct experience, has been created by an argument, even if sometimes the fact that it's an argument is suppressed, often just for the sake of uh, efficiency. Everything has been established by an argument and is susceptible, therefore, to being overturned by a future argument. And in the science, they call this falsifiability. We might, inf we might say, indeed, that a fact is nothing more than a frozen argument, a place where a certain line of inquiry has come temporarily to rest, and we can reflect in this connection that the word that science assigns to the things that it knows with the greatest degree of certainty is theory. 
theory is as good as it gets. In fact, it, get, it takes a lot just to raise an idea to the status of a theory. And it doesn't get any better than that. So, I'm going to abbreviate this part, but basically studying the liberal arts is about learning how to make arguments. I will say that the historian Simon Shama tells the story of a student who approached him after lecture to complain that his father hadn't sent him to Harvard to become more confused. And, and Shama said, actually, he had. I mean, the truth is he probably sent him to Harvard to become more rich, but um, <laughs> we'll leave that aside. Um, College is a place to start to learn that most of what we know, and history is indeed exemplary in this regard, is much more provisional and complicated than we, we usually care to admit. Uh, which may sound like mental masturbation, the pointless multiplication of complexity and nuance, the endless entertainment of theories, hypotheses, and alternatives, everything that people mean by the word academic when they use it in a pejorative sense. <laughs> what it actually is is an honest confrontation with reality. The world is full of immensely complex, intricate things, like the structure of an enzyme, or the language of a Shakespeare play, or the workings of a modern economy. Despite our desire for clear and simple answers, the truth is very hard to come by. And yeah, I mean, some knowledge is settled enough to be regarded as factual, and, uh, and mastering some portion, some relevant portion of it is part of a liberal education, too, or any education. But mainly, it's about learning how to, how to doubt. And it's really hard, and it's supposed to be hard. And it's supposed to feel kind of bad, you know? It's, it's an iterative process where you, like, you write a paper, and your professor kind of like rips it apart, hopefully says something nice so you don't feel too bad about yourself. And then you go to, you go to office hours, and you talk about it. And then you do it again, you do it again, you do it again. You write a three-page paper first week of first year, and then you write a bunch of 15-page papers when you're a junior. And then you write, I don't know, you guys have a thesis here? It's an optional thesis, I'm guessing. Yeah. So maybe you do like a, you know, <laughs> and then and then you know, or if it's uh, if it's in the sciences, then it's not maybe it isn't papers, maybe it's lab reports or or computer programs or whatever. So it's supposed to feel bad. It's supposed to be really hard. It's supposed to take a lot of time. Uh, if if you think about the proverbial ten thousand hours that it takes to acquire a skill. Uh, then if you go to college four years, 30 weeks a year, it would work out to about 12 hours a day. Which might be overly optimistic, but it wouldn't be bad. Um, certainly it's better than like 12 hours a week, which um, there's a recent book called uh, Academically Adrift. The semicolon is limited learning on college campuses. And it found that 12 hours a week is about how much time students spend outside of class on their classwork now. The book also finds that m most students don't learn very much in college. OK, that was part two. So here's part three. Um, I have to, have to go back in a sense, or just get a little meta and say that in describing what a liberal arts education entails, I've actually blurred the very distinction that I started with, or that I was insisting on before, rather, and I want to come back to now. Um, I've just been explaining about how college helps you or should help you learn to think with precision and rigor. But we need to recognize, and I don't think we talk about this in academia very much, and I think we need to talk and think about it a lot more, and I think I need to think about it a lot more. Uh, there are two different kinds of thinking, two different kinds of rigorous thinking, that college should ask you to do. And they correspond to the two ways of conceiving of the purpose of college that I was talking about before. The first kind is that instrumental kind, where you acquire tools and skills that enable you to operate in the world and on the world, to solve problems, to get things done, to become an expert, a specialist, a technocrat, a professional. A liberal arts education is very good at training you to do that, which is why studying the liberal arts is very useful on the job market. That wasn't a typo. It's very useful in the job market, certainly if you go to a place like Williams, despite what everyone's telling you. Um, that kind of thinking involves addressing specific technical questions in whatever discipline that have specific answers. Answers that can be worked out through predictable, iterable methods. Equations, experiments, studies, statistical models. The knowledge so acquired 
is also sequential and cumulative. Calculus 1, calculus 2, linear algebra, differential equations, right? You learn in a certain order. Uh, and you learn more and more. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. That's a, that's, that is an important purpose of college. And it does enable you to achieve what the educational bureaucrats like to call mastery. Mastery of a subject is what they mean, but mastery of a subject enables you, in turn, to have mastery over the world, or over some portion of the world. It's kind of power. But this kind of learning does not work for that other kind of thinking. The kind that we use to address those fundamental, and in some sense, fundamentally irresolvable questions of value and purpose and meaning that should lie at the heart of a liberal arts education, because they lie at the heart of life itself. The questions raised by experience, the questions that need to be addressed in order to navigate experience, in order to go through the world, in order to conduct your life. And here, I'm afraid, we also need to make a distinction between the humanities and the other liberal arts. Sorry, non-humanists. Because I believe that it is the humanities and only the humanities that enable you that are to, to ask them, that are designed to enable you to ask them. History, philosophy, religious studies, above all, in my opinion, literature and the other arts, are the record of the ways that people have come to terms with being human. Again, I don't think that's etymologically, historically, the reason they're called humanities, but that's how I understand the word. They address the questions that are proper to us, not as this or that kind of specialist, this or that kind of professional, but as individuals as such, as, as people, we might say. The very questions we're apt to ask when we look up from our work and think about our lives, assuming we ever do, assuming we have, we have time to, questions about love, death, family, morality, time, truth, God, and everything else within the wide, starred universe of human experience. That kind of thinking is different. It can and must be rigorous and precise, but it can't be sequential or cumulative or iterable or predictable. It can't be captured or measured with the kinds of assessments you're used to being subjected to in other educational contexts. You guys may be the internet generation, the Harry Potter generation, and the school shooting generation, but you're also certainly the standardized test generation. The assessment generation. Uh, multiple choice, questions, skill-based exams, memorization and regurgitation. It doesn't involve the same capacities and isn't good for the same purposes as that other kind of thinking, which is why we often reach for other words to name it. Words like reflection or contemplation, which, which gesture towards the soul or the spirit, not just the mind or the intellect. Now let me try to make this a little more tangible by offering a few points of orientation uh, to try to bring this distinction between the two kinds of thinking and the two kinds of things that you can do with that thinking into sharper focus. And they're, they're, they're texts that have helped me. Uh, the first one comes from someone named Eva Braun. You guys know that name? Uh, St. John's uh, Great Books College in Maryland. Apparently she's been teaching there for about 63 years. Um, and she has a book um, from way back in her 60s or whenever she was, however she old she was then, called uh, Paradoxes of Education in a Republic. Uh, and she talks about the difference between instrumental reason, which can be used as a tool to operate on the world, and what she calls the question-asking intellect, which functions, she says, by being receptive to the world. A genuine question, she writes, is an expectant vacancy a receptive openness, a defined ignorance, and above all, a directed desire. You can tell that she, she reads a lot of Plato. Um, my second point of reference comes from the political philosopher Hannah Arendt, who has a book called Crises of the Republic, a bunch of essays she wrote in the 60s about sort of more, more topical essays than she was used to writing. Uh, and one of them is on the Pentagon Papers, which you know is the secret history of the Vietnam War, as written by, uh, within the Defense Department. So it's really 
the Pentagon Papers and really her essay are really about the architects of the Vietnam War, the so-called whiz kids, the gang of experts that David Halberstam would later call in a rancidly sarcastic phrase that has since somehow lost its irony and become the standard compliment we pay our high achieving students, the best and the brightest. Arendt refers to them as, quote, the problem solvers because they conducted the war by reducing it to a set of metrics of inputs, algorithms, procedures, and finally of predictions, which she says unaccountably never came true. I think you can think of the, edu the, educa the educational problem solvers who reduce education to inputs, algorithms, proceed procedures and predictions which somehow unaccountably never come true. I think that'll be more close to your experience as the, the testing generation. The problem solvers, Arendt writes, did not judge. They calculated. They trusted the calculating powers of their brains at the expense of their mind's capacity for experience and its ability to learn from it. Now, needless to say, Arendt's calculating power corresponds to Braun's instrumental reason, and what she calls the ability to learn from experience corresponds to Brand's receptive openness and defined ignorance, which first of all means acknowledged ignorance. My last point of reference comes from a contemporary educator named Diana Seneschal, who has a recent book called Republic of Noise. She also teaches philosophy. She teaches at a public high school in New York, amazingly enough. A public high school, an ordinary public high school, not a fancy one. In Republic of Noise, she discusses some of the fallacies that, uh, fallacies that operate in mainstream education now, in K through 12, and one is the idea that students need, be, need to be able to achieve mastery over all the material that is put in front of them, that they need to learn it completely and demonstrate that competence through certain kinds of assessments, ideally quantifiable ones. And again, mastery is a perfectly reasonable standard when we're talking about calculus or Spanish or chemistry. But when you talk about Plato, or I would say Shakespeare, or anything else in the humanities, there is no such thing as mastery. No one ever masters those works, which is precisely why they're worth coming back to again and again. After all, you would never learn the same concept in chemistry twice, unless you forget it. So why do we keep reading these things again and again? Well, no one ever masters the questions that those works impose on us either, which is why those two are worth coming back to, are necessary to come back to again and again. Uh, the writer Jeff Dyer calls these the questions that stay put. The questions I would add that the world asks of you rather than the other way around. And the chief question that the world asks of you is, who are you? To use a distinction from James Baldwin, not what are you, but who are you? Baldwin says, the world had already told me what I was. And needless to say, this is about identity and identity groups and how you identify yourself. Baldwin knew he had been told what he was. He wanted to figure out who he was, meaning as an individual. The only appropriate relationship in which to stand to those works and those questions is receptive openness, defined ignorance, and directed desire. You don't read King Lear so you can master King Lear. You read it for what it does to you for the way it changes you. And then you take that into the next thing you read, and indeed into the rest of your life. And hopefully that experience, and it's an experience, it's not like a lesson, enhances what Arendt might call your mind's capacity for experience and its ability to learn from it. So this is what I think studying the humanities should do for you, and I think the humanities should be central to a liberal education, but, but only if you study the humanities the right way. I mean, one of the things that the uh, mastery assessment bureaucrats have turned the humanities into, especially in high school, is just another technocratic subject that you can ask multiple choice questions about. And another thing that's happened to the humanities in the college is that they've been turned into ideological indoctrination, where you're taught what you are and not who you are or help to understand who you are. Um, 
They need to be taught as an open-ended exploration that instructors and students undertake together. When a professor trains you in the other kind of thinking, the instrumental kind, they have the answers. They should have the answers. They shouldn't be in front of the classroom if they don't. In the context of reflection, they don't. The big questions are persistent questions, again, because nobody has the answers. So I urge you, as you go forward in college, to find professors in whatever discipline who are seeking to humanize you. Not just specialize you. Now, I'm almost done here. If I had to pick a single word to sum up what reflection can help you achieve, what Arendt found so missing in the problem solvers, it would be wisdom. And it's no coincidence that the practice of philosophy uh, means love of wisdom. And if I had to define wisdom, which I think is an interesting word to think about, I don't know how the dictionary defines it, but um, I wouldn't be satisfied with that. Um, I would say that it, it's not knowledge per se, but a kind of deafness, a kind of tact or touch in the application of knowledge, specifically such knowledge as derives from experience. A wise person is the kind of person you go to, not for information, but for counsel. Not for good answers, but for better questions. Now, I imagine you might receive, uh, the students in the room, the notion that wisdom should be your goal with considerable dismay. After all, the word tends to be associated with age, and for good reason. Wisdom is something that people don't achieve, if at all, until late in life. So let's just say that college, I think, should be, in addition to the start of your vocational path that will last a lifetime, the start of a long road to becoming wise. And after all, he called it philosophy, Socrates, not, not wis love of wisdom, not wisdom. Wisdom is kind of like virtue. You never quite achieve it, you just try to. Which is fine that it's going to take a long time. Because for all of your desire to change the world, it's likely going to be quite a while before you have any real power to do so. And you might as well acquire some wisdom along the way before, by the time you get to, to achieve that power. If you want to see what happens when power is exercised in the absence of wisdom, you can also look at today's whiz kids, the ones who run Silicon Valley, and therefore determine so much of our world. As ta Coates said in a different context, very young, and very smart is always a dangerous combination. And he wasn't even talking about, he didn't even include very powerful. One of the problems with Silicon Valley, as the musician Zoe Keating has put it, and this is from my new book, is that the tech people can't imagine that everything they make isn't totally awesome for everybody else. Because they can't imagine, as she called it, scenarios outside their own reality. I said that the chief question that the, that the world imposes on you that college ought to help you begin to work out is who are you? The heart of reflection is self-reflection. The essence of knowledge is self-knowledge. If you don't know yourself, if you haven't, as it were, become visible to yourself, you don't know the biases with which you know everything else. And you also don't know the motives that move you to action. But self-knowledge and knowledge of others are two sides of the same coin. They happen together and they work together. And I think, again, that literature in particular enables you to think about yourself by asking you to think about others. You should read not to affirm or entrench your identity, but to expand your humanity. By allowing you to experience in the most intimate and immediate way what it feels like to be someone else, Literature instills the fundamental moral lesson, which is that you're not the center of the universe, that other people are just as real as you, and also that they aren't you. The novelist and philosopher Rebecca Goldstein has written, I put my faith in fiction, in its power to make vividly present how different the world feels to each of us. Its power, in other words, to enable you to imagine scenarios outside your own reality. And that's the power you need to have before you can responsibly use any other kind of power. Because before you can make things better or have an impact or change society, all phrases that speak of power, you are seeking power when you say you want to do those things. And it, there's nothing wrong with that, but you need to recognize that 
that entails a lot of responsibility. So by all means, take your moral passion forth into the world when you graduate. But in the meantime, your job is not yet to act. Your job is to think. Before you change the world, you have to change your mind. Okay, sock it to me. <laughs> Your turn. In the back, yes. Um, thank you for this talk. Thank you for coming here. Um, so this discussion of self-knowledge, uh, discovering who you are, not what you are, um, I don't know if it will please you, but I'm in full agreement with this, right? But it seems to me like what this does is a privilege of the individual. You actually got to my question in your last set of comments. This idea of not being like the whiz kids, like those punks and so on. Right. Having a, a scenario of what other people are going through. And I think that's also the benefit of the pursuit of this sort of self knowledge. But I think I, I'm kind of want to push you to reconcile those two endeavors because I'm thinking here of Tocqueville, right, who kind of identifies this tendency to fall into oneself in the age of equality, the age of the individual, where self reflection becomes the coin of the realm, right? Um, it's driven by these students doing it on their own and the professor facilitating that process, right? But the agent is the student. How do you get that individual endeavor to link up with that broader perspective, that wisdom, that, that love of wisdom that you're describing? Couldn't we say that those two are in kind of contradiction with each other? I really don't think so. I, I, I've gotten versions of the question before. I think it is clear, and I've gotten versions of this question before. I don't think it's a bad question, uh, and I've had to think about the answer. Um, self-reflection is very different from self-involvement or self-centeredness, or narcissism, or selfishness. Um, I actually think it's a way out of those things, because again, you become visible to yourself, so you start to see yourself in relation to others. But I will also say that, um, maybe I need to think about this more carefully, maybe this is not true, but um, I don't think self-knowledge implies, I don't think it, it automatically implies that you're going to uh, do anything better for anybody else. I think that, that just, it's neither here nor there, right? Um, I think that, um, you know, they say like uh, reading books makes you a better person. I, I wouldn't say that. I think it makes you a freer person. I think self-knowledge makes you freer because it helps you to, again, um, break the grip of the things you've been taught to believe. Now, what you do with that freedom, I think it's a separate question uh, and needs to be addressed in a separate way. But I don't think, I don't at all think, I, I don't at all think they're, uh, they're, they're in opposition. I think they can work together. But I absolutely agree with you that self-reflection is not the be-all and end-all. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I, again, I mean, because it's so individual, as I'm sure you know, right, there's a whole school of thought that we've gone too far in that direction. Yeah. Right, like the transcendent kind of, I don't think it would fly nowadays, right, but there's some sort of fixed truth. Plato certainly talks about this, right? And so those kind of standards are in tension with, obviously, with an individual kind of questioning and challenging which is what I think a lot of us do right in the classroom. Like, why do we know that Plato was right? This is something we need to question, but, you know, something is lost there in that you kind of feel weak or enfeebled by that process. So you might give up on the pursuit of greater collective good and you just kind of stick to what you know as an individual through that self-reflection. Right? I don't, right, but I don't, I, again, I don't think that individualism in the sense of individual self-reflection has to be disabling. And I think, you know, if modernity is the age of sort of the, the new, free, self-reflective individual, it's also the age of a lot of collective action. I don't think they're antithetical. I do think, I do think that, um, look, we're never going to go back, well, okay. So my first thought is we're never going to go back to the time when you could just receive your values. And my second thought is that's exactly what we're going back to. That's exactly what we're going back to. And when I, see, I'm, when I see the campus orthodoxy, this is what I see. I see people receiving their values and not questioning them so they can fit comfortably within the group. They were taught something in their nice little liberal enclaves and then it was reinforced when they went to their uh, very progressive high schools. And then it's being re-reinforced at their very progressive college. And they can go out into their dinner parties in Brooklyn or Seattle and never have it challenged and feel very comfortably ensconced within the group and they'll get lots of likes on Facebook 
and I think it's really scary. Also, I just miss the modern individual. Like, I like that individual, that resistant, dissenting, James Baldwin type of person. Yeah. For people that are like moving into a career, how do you like suggest that once you've gotten like a job or something like that, and like you don't have those professors or teachers around you to encourage this sort of contemplative thinking? How do you suggest going about, you know, still practicing that even right, when you have a job? Well, it's it's been said. I, one of my professors said this. I'm sure it's been said uh, by others that the job of a professor of college is to engineer their own obsolescence, so you no longer need a guide. You learn how to educate yourself. So that, uh, the real issue, I think, is whether you're going to have the time to and whether you're going to give yourself the time to. And whether if you've become a reader in college, which I hope you have, you continue that and you insist on making space for that. That's what I would say. I mean, there are people who do it, but it's hard. I mean, this is also why, this is also why it's so horrible when people waste their college on just practical things, because like, this is your best chance. Like, don't think it's going to be like this in the future. Or you could just drop out. <laughs> you could be like a, you know, be like a Bard graduate and just, you know, screw it. I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work in a coffee shop and make twenty six thousand dollars, and I'm gonna read. That's it. In broad strokes, I agree with your points. However, you come off as very arrogant and condescending. <laughs> and I'm thinking, if you actually care about your message, yeah. which I would encourage you to. Um, would it be more effective to come off as less arrogant? <laughs> um, do you guys think it would be more effective if I were less arrogant? I, it's, I mean, it's, it's just, it's partly it's just who I am. Do, uh, arrogant, certain, what? Yeah, arrogant, fine. I don't know. Passionate, what? To, what? I'm with you, but it's still, it's not the most effective way of communicating. So, I should come across as like less certain or less or more humble or no I'm asking yes not necessarily less certain but if you're talking about like espousing a view of being open to being changed and things then maybe you need to be like less certain of it in a sense how can I be so certain of the need to be uncertain <laughs> seriously I don't know. Um, I'll think about it. Um, I would also say that, uh, I mean, I want to be an effective communicator, but I also, like, my style is like the two by four hits you in the, in the head. And I, I kind of feel like some, t I, I feel like there's way too much, um, um, there's, too, there's too much sort of, um, there's, can't think of the word. Mealy-mouthed. People are too mealy-mouthed. There's too much euphemism and, and, you know, maybe this, maybe that, and I don't want to offend you, and I do want to offend you. It's good. I want to confront you. There, there's, some, there's definitely merit to that. And I think if you can do that yeah. without being as condescending, you could probably have a good thing going. Because on both sides, both the conservative and the very liberal side, yeah. I feel like they're doing exactly what you said in the beginning and saying, Oh, this is good, this is bad. Right. And in a sense, you're doing the exact same thing again. And okay. if you can get out of that trap, I okay. commend you. I'll think about it. <laughs> Believe it or not, I have a follow up question to that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you already had the question before you said what you said. Uh, on a more personal level, um, so thank you for that talk. It's totally fascinating. I'm curious, for my own reasons, um, when the last time was that you had a big change of mind? Oh my God! Thank I'm you not for asking me that. that. I think about it a lot in my own life. So, as a all the time. Okay. So all I, the time. For think, example, sorry, I'm interrupting. No, I just in a commentary on style aside, I think the question of what happens after you get out of college, whether you go on reformulating your perspective or rethinking things, is very relevant, and as someone who's been out of college, I'm guessing he's yeah. been out of college for a while. I, I, uh, I, sh I think I change my mind more frequently than I, 
than I used to. So for example, so I'm writing this book about how artists make a living and I started it and it came out of an essay that I guess is like four years old now that really took that position of like art and money should never touch and the market is evil because I thought the market was evil and I've completely rethought that. I don't think that mar art and money shouldn't touch and I don't think the market is evil. And did you change your mind because of the things people said to you? Or yeah, well things people said to me and thinking about it a lot. Yeah, yeah, and, and <coughs> yeah, I sh yes, Th yeah, thanks for asking me that, in the back. So, you talk, I, thank, you, thank you for your talk, and I definitely agree and have seen very much the progressive orthodoxy these days, and you talk a lot about that on college campuses, but what is the practical, how, would, how do we practically fix that? Is, do we uh, require that every student take a certain number of, say, humanities courses or something of the sort? Or, like, how, how do we achieve what you're talking? Here's my one big thought on that. Because, you know, again, I mean, I've been thinking, I started to give this talk about a year ago, and this is like the, I don't know, fourth or fifth college that I've given it. Um, uh, the number everyone quotes to me is that they think that the PC police account for about 10% of the student body and the other 90% are just terrified. And I understand that if you're an a member of the 90%, you're going to keep your mouth shut because you don't want to get your head shot off. So I think what needs to happen is that some significant portion of that 90% needs to get together in public in a big circle and hold hands and say, this is what we believe. And they don't all have to believe the same thing, except like we believe that we should be able to have a more open conversation than we've been having. We really don't like this. I think that could go a long way. I, I, it could be naive. I think doing it would go a long way. The question is, how do you get to that point? That could be a hard point. I am also open to other suggestions because I would love to hear. Go ahead. I, in your mind, is there anything that should be off limits for debate? Or are you of the thinking that everything and anything should be debated and discussed on all sides? Uh, I'm of the latter opinion. I'll tell you, the, uh, one of the big formative uh, moments for me in terms of thinking about speech was, um, I think it was in the late 70s, and the American Nazi Party wanted to have a march in Skokie, Illinois, which is uh, a suburb of Chicago that's not only very Jewish, but at the time had a lot of Holocaust survivors. And I grew up in a Jewish community and people were very angry. And the American Civil Liberties Union uh, defended the Nazis. I don't think the march ever happened. I think they got the permit and they decided not to do it. That was a really big lesson for me. I don't like Nazis. I don't want them speaking on my campus and you don't have to invite them. But when you start, um, when you start deciding that one opinion that, there's a, that any one opinion is beyond the pale of expression, once you start down that road, there's no logical place to stop. Uh, and the only, you know, there's no logical place to stop. And, I, and, and, and what I see, I mean, if you want to not have Nazis speak on campus, I get that. But the, narrow, the, the range of acceptable discourse seems to me in many cases to have been so narrow that even someone who say, would espouse the positions of someone like Hillary Clinton would not be acceptable and is suppressed. So it's really become a very narrow orthodoxy. So I think, I mean, I could expand on this. I've had to think about this a lot because of these exchanges, because of giving this talk. There's no, one of the problems is that there's no neutral position above the political fray from which you can look down and say, that's a good opinion, that's a bad opinion. Yeah, we all agree that Nazism is bad, except for the Nazis, right? But in principle, there's no way of saying that. And it becomes important when you start to restrict other. It's like, well, who are you to say that? Are we going to appoint a committee? Are we going to appoint a committee that decides what, we, what the rest of us can say? Because we'd have to do that. And, and if they make that decision, are we going to institute punishments? Would somebody be subject to formal shaming or expulsion? I mean, these are the kinds of questions that you end up starting to ask. So what do you think? I, I'm in agreement with you that okay. I think that once we do start to draw lines, it becomes a slippery slope towards yeah. restricting more yeah. and more speech. Yeah. 
There was a couple of hands here. Go ahead. But then I guess along that line, like if all speech, like if you should discuss and debate everything, then do you have the right to express yourself like in any manner? Like can you draw swastikas and not face repercussions? And can you like write the N word and not face repercussions? Like when do we, like is there a line to be drawn there? Or is that just your own personal expression? It's a tough question. It's a tough question. Um, I'm not going to say that it's an easy question. And I mean, again, there's, there's se things that, seem, that would seem to violate community standards. And where do you draw the line between something that's really heinous, like those examples, and something that's kind of sketchy, but we're going to permit? Um, I will only observe somebody, more than one person has made this point today, that historically, when there have been speech restrictions, they've generally been imposed on people on the left. And you have to assume that you're always going to be, your side is always going to be in power because at some point the other side might be in power. And then you won't have an argument to make when they express your speech, when they suppress your speech. Did you have your interview? Yeah. Um, if you'll humor me for a moment. Um, I had a, an interesting interaction where I was talking to another student about Marxism. And um, she said, you should really take a class that'll challenge your opinion on that. <laughs> and, um, it sounded to me like not a very common argument, and I was just wondering like what you think about um, how that can be taken in the wrong way, like that ha debating with other students can be kind of suppressed in the idea that it should belong to classrooms, to professors to challenge those opinions, that like <coughs> it can kind of, it can be misconstrued as like you should, like we shouldn't discuss this. I don't, I wouldn't agree with that. Yeah. I mean, to me, the whole, like, I mean, sort of the idea is like, you know, you take these classes and you read these books and they blow your mind or open your mind or piss you off and you have debates in class mm -hmm. that the professor kind of moderates. And then, because you're not running around to 12 extracurriculars and internships and, you know, overloading yourself, you hang out together in the dining hall or the dorm room. People call these late night bull sessions. And you hash this crap out. And my, well, my professor said, well, I read that. And like, well, like, that's what's supposed to happen. So they're both supposed to happen. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's dumb to like confine it to a class. Then it really just becomes academic, <laughs> right? Yeah? Was there another hand here? Oh, go ahead. Um, so much of what uh, you've spoken about, I think, was fundamental to uh, Bob Pagino's ideas in terms of education, particularly as it relates to reflection, self-knowledge, experience. Um, and I guess I want to sort of uh, hook up with the woman who was asking the question back here. Fundamentally, what's the methodology um, that we need to use to accomplish that? And certainly, Bob Pagino's idea was that Simply, or just consistent with what you're saying, that our college campus was much too hom homogenous, and that to, to create the the foundation or the kind of the the medium to do what you're talking about, students had to be taken off campus to live in environments that were completely different than their own. I'd certainly like to hear your uh, take on that one. You know, can we really do this on campus? I think is 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 a basic question. Fundamental to your your talk, I think, was that the, the the goal was to kind of know how we're going to be in the world, who we are, and how we relate to people. Um, and I think fundamental to that, or or perhaps consistent with that, is being in the students, world, getting students off campus. Right. And, but. Um, also, the other question is, if students are on campus, um, what do you do in terms of uh, helping professors do the kind of thing that you're, you're talking about? Because some of what we've heard in our discussions as the, the um, alumni of, of Padino's uh, thinking is that uh, students don't feel that in the classroom these differences of opinion really come up again consistent with what you're talking about in terms of everybody has sort of similar values. 
And, and uh, if there are differences, they may be stark, and people are not comfortable really, uh, and, and the professors are not comfortable having conversations with these starkly different opinions. So that's interesting. So you can't talk about them outside of class, and you can't talk about them in class. <laughs> so you've asked two separate questions. I've never thought about the first one. I mean, I, I think you're right. I mean, we could rethink the whole model of a residential college and, and try to have some kind of world mixed in with it. I mean, people have said that the good thing about college is that you're not in the world and that you can step back and reflect, but maybe there needs to be some more kind of dialectic sort of back and forth. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's sort of an engineering problem, right? That's a design problem. Um, it's not like there's some philosophical, to me there's no, I mean, I, I think I agree with you philosophically. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a certain sense in which conversations about these kinds of questions among undergraduates inevitably, at least if you're the adult, take a certain unreal, have an unreal quality because they're kind of talking about things that they haven't really experienced yet. And maybe, I, I kind of think that's okay. Uh, sometimes you are talking about things you've experienced. Um, but yeah, maybe there needs to be more of that. More, more world in the, in the college, you know, sort of more peanut butter in the chocolate or whatever. But um, the other question, well, that, that's a good question. I mean, first of all, never mind professors becoming comfortable having these conversations. How about professors just feeling like it's their job to provide a humanistic rather than a technocratic education? I mean, or just, well, I mean, you're at a liberal arts college, so it's probably not as much of a problem here, but how about just professors, it's your job to teach undergraduates. Let's just start with that, you know, because the whole incentive structure in academia is completely screwed up, where you have no incentive to spend time on your teaching. But I understand you can't just say, I guess you can't just say to a professor, like, well, stop, I don't care if you're uncomfortable, you've got to do it anyway, because if everything, you know, if everything in their environment is inhibiting them from doing it, if there are professional risks to engineering uncomfortable conversations in class, they're not going to do it. I taught for a semester at Scripps, one of the Claremont colleges, and it was a class where we ended up, because it was a class in like opinion writing. So we ended up having conversations about the things they were writing about. You know, reasonable differences of opinion. And several of the students said, and they were juniors and seniors, they said, I've never had a class like this. This is kind of nice. We're actually having a debate. I just want to say again, it didn't used to be like this. That's all. This is not a historical inevitability. OK. Um, first, thanks for being here. Um, I guess the thing I wanted to ask was you had this, um, in the middle of your talk, you mentioned that like it's very hard to know things, that part of the purpose of liberal arts education is yeah. to know that you can't know certain things. I'm interested in how this relates to how you've gotten involved in this debate over campus liberal orthodoxy, because it seems like a lot of the people who criticize, I guess, the liberal consensus on campus seem to think it comes from like a denial of the idea that there can be facts, like they can blame postmodernism or something else like that, and you seem to be coming from the opposite direction. So where do you think... Go ahead. Yes, yeah, sir. If it doesn't come from sort of a denial of things we already know, where do you think this orthodoxy comes from? So just to be clear, I'm actually saying two different things because we have those two different kinds of thinking and I conflated them at certain points. The sort of technocratic, uh, sort of positivist knowledge where we build up knowledge, uh, it's kind of the scientific model. It's, it's not that we can't know things, it's that it's very hard to know things. And in a strict sense, we never know them with certainty. Like somebody could disprove the theory of gravity. And that's at least theoretically possible. That's different. And then there's the sort of the other kind of thinking that's values where, and maybe people like Pinker don't understand this, there's, there's I mean, they're values. They're not things that can be proven. They can only things that be debated, but they can be debated with rigor. And it doesn't mean everything is just a wishy-washy mass of, you know, emotions. But just to understand that, you know, we can't establish facts at all in that realm because it's the realm of values, it's not the realm of facts. So, does that answer your question or you're saying, I'm sorry. It basically answers my question. I yeah. was just, yeah. But you're also saying that, that somehow the contention around free speech, there's a feeling like, uh, well, it's connected to the, this sort of maybe post post-structuralist or postmodern idea that there are no facts, there's no certainty? I, I just, I mean, I'm not saying that's my position or anything. I just mean, I've heard this somewhat frequently on the idea that, like, you know, some sort of, like, 
challenge for challenge's sake to cultural norms or cultural. No, but you're making me realize something interesting, and I know I'm painting with a very broad brush, but these 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 postmodern ideological firebrand professors exactly invert what I just said. They don't believe that there are facts, but they do believe that there are moral certainties. Maybe those two positions have to go together for some reason. I don't know. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned in your article that you think like sports don't maybe have a role on college campuses. Um, do you mind elaborating on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really, that's an aside, yeah. right? I, I, was hoping you'd go I was talking about how people hate, hate on athletes. Yeah. And I just say, by the way, I don't even think there should be any athletes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't mind that there are people here who are athletic and who play sports, but I, I, I do think that, that sports has become completely corrupting in higher ed. I mean, first of all, big time, football, basketball, huge problem. I also think, I don't think that sports should be a criterion for admissions. I don't think schools should pay as much should spend as much money on them as they do, or any money. I mean, if you want to have sports at the club level, knock yourself out. Um, but there's a great book called, uh, I think it's called The Price of Admission, where they, he talks about all, basically he talks about how the elite get their, you know, have engineered the, uh, the meritocracy, the selective college admissions process to make sure that they're kids, right? So there are all these categories that favor the wealthy like legacy and donors, those are obvious. But sports, we sometimes think they are a countervailing force, but in fact they reinforce it. Because, you know, for every basketball or football player, there are like 20 people who play one of these upper class, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you guys have, I mean, at Yale at least there's a sailing team, there's an equestrian team. You know, if you have to be able to, if you have to, be able to own a horse to play a sport, <laughs> It's probably an upper class sport. <laughs> do, do you want to do you want to respond at all? <laughs> no, I actually kind of was more thinking of it in terms of the time it takes <laughs> and whether that gets in the way of our well, that's individual true. growth. And yeah. Yeah. Humanity. yeah. Or if you think that in fact it adds to it because we're a team. Well, I mean, I think that's historically the argument. It's character building and stuff. But it's gotten, again, I don't know if this is true of every school and every sport, but certainly in a lot of those sports, a lot of marquee sports, it basically consumes for practical purposes all of your life or, or any available. And then, because they've become, it's become a business. And then there's also, sorry, just one more thing. It's not like it's a big secret to the rest of the world that one of the ways to get into a fancy college is to play a sport. So now there's this huge industry of youth sports leagues and, and again it favors the wealthy and it, you know, you know children with like, I don't know, sports injuries. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you could expand on the extracurriculars as a detractment from time spent discussing things and having hard conversations because as I'm sure we're all aware now that it, Sports are an opportunity to get leadership experience, and extracurriculars are things that people are allowed to put on their resume. So not everyone's fortunate, like myself, to come here with work, prior work experience, and they have to find a way to get competitive to be able to get an internship. Um, but that also then takes away from academics. Yeah, I mean, I, listen, I, I, you know, you heard me say this earlier. I feel like. You know, admission, uh, matriculation at Williams or a comparable college should be taken as, as an opportunity not to think about any of that stuff. Because you don't have to. You're going to go into the world with a golden ticket. You don't have to think about this stuff. And it seems like a terrible waste of time. Um, but, you know, I mean, I sometimes think that um, students have constructed an alternative college for themselves. Like college is supposed to be about taking classes and thinking. But, you know, academically adrift, students are doing less and less of that 12 hours a week because they've realized that actually what they need to do is a completely different set of things that are all extracurricular or, or even extramural internships. So they've constructed a college for a completely different set of purposes which are oriented towards the job market. But I, I really dispute whether this is actually necessary.
Did you ask one before? I have not. You have not, so go ahead, ask one. So, I don't know how many of us here are seniors, but you know, we're looking for post-grad opportunities, jobs and things like that. Uh, what would the kind of application side of everything that you've talked about today be to kind of having a fulfilling career? Um, is there an application? And if so, what, what <coughs> might that be? I don't think there is an application. I think the stuff I talk about in the book, yeah. where I say, you know, I mean, I started, again, changing my mind, right? I started with this idea when I wrote the original essay that, that people should not do law, medicine, finance, consulting, and they should, like, I don't know, be hippies and artists and humanities people. And, and then at a certain point, I realized, no, that's not actually what I mean. It's really about how you make the choice. And there can be good reasons to be a lawyer and to choose to be a lawyer, and there's certainly bad reasons to choose to be an artist. I mean, just go to Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, so, 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 so that's what I would say. You know, that I think has vocational relevance. Uh, you, yeah. Hi. Um. Uh, how do you feel about the test optional movement for colleges? And if you're sort of in agreement with it, what do you think it'll take for top institutions like Williams to get on board with it? I haven't thought about this a lot, so I, I want to say that. Um, you know, we, we know that uh, SAT scores correlate with family wealth, so they're basically just a measure of family wealth. The thing is, I do think that probably anything you put in its place would also end up being a proxy for family wealth. Because, you know, whatever, portfolio or, you know, experiences. Well, I went to Guatemala. Well, good for you. You know, I worked, <laughs> in, I worked in a tasty freeze because I had to. You know, I don't mean me personally. I didn't, also didn't go to Guatemala. But, um, so that's my answer. You know, the, the real issue is not how do we de-emphasize testing, but how do we somehow constructed admissions process. And I think you were, were in the room when I said, I really believe, and this is another way I changed my mind, I started in 2008, we need to make elite college admissions more egalitarian, or even just, I think my real starting point was we need to make a difference so we're not producing these achievement machines. And I ended up with like, the real problem is that we have outsourced the education of our elite to a set of private institutions. And what we really need is we need a Berkeley on every, you know, in every state, or five of them in every state. But they need to be Berkeley like in 1970 when it was free. So, yeah. And I know that maybe makes us feel bad. I also went to a private college. But really, I mean, it really shouldn't be the way we do things. Part of the reason, I just want to say one more thing, part of the reason the mania for private college admissions has gotten so bad is because we've defunded the public. I mean, it's part of the reason is that we've defunded public education. Yeah, um, there are tons of organizations out there that are in a similar space and trying to call attention to similar issues as we've been um, picking apart tonight. And some of the ones that come to mind are the campus reforms out there, the college fixes out there that end up doing a lot more rage stoking as opposed to thoughtful discussion and back and forth. I'm Not sorry, who, who does what? I'm glad that you haven't heard of them, let's put it that mm -hmm. way. Um, a lot of organizations that seem a lot more interested in you know, triggering liberals and... Uh, Under the guise of we're promoting free speech and open discourse. Right, and yes. they claim to operate in a similar space yes. as you are, and we've just been sitting yes. in a super thoughtful uh, discussion right. about this. Why can the argument be so vapid or mindless on the other and not that you should be in the space of having to to defend it but is there anything that you can well i mean i mean i've heard a little you know in passing uh, what are the <coughs> motives of organizations like that i think maybe they're just to own the libs right yeah. but um i mean I, I may be wrong but uh fire what's the, uh, the they're not no it's not another one as far as i understand it they actually want to promote free speech mm -hmm. in a genuine way so there is at least one organization out there like that. Again, I think they need allies, and I think they need allies among students. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think if it's going to change at all, it's going to come from students. But for now, you think sort of the, the, the resistance kind of is limited to organizations like FIRE and kind of scattered diasporas of concerned faculty at different, at different colleges right now? Or what's the state of the... 
I like scattered diasporas of concerned faculty, or, or just individuals wandering in the wilderness in despair. <laughs> I guess what I would like to see, and maybe this exists already, is fire-like organizations on campuses, but student organizations. Students occupying publicly that position. We're not on the left, we're not on the right, maybe, maybe we're liberals, but we, we, that's not the point, we're not going to talk about that. We are in favor of this. We are in favor of an environment, of creating an environment where we can have real discussions. That's it. Okay, last question. So you mentioned that you don't think students spend like, enough time with their academics while in college and only spend like, 12 hours a week or something studying. And you seem to have blamed that on extra, that we spend so much time doing extracurriculars. But I don't see extracurricular like, activities as much of a problem as like the role of technology in our lives and how we spend like a lot of time on our phones or people like binge watch like YouTube videos or like Netflix or whatever. So if the problem like is in fact like the time we spend like being distracted rather than the time we spend on extracurriculars, what do you think can be done about that? Well, as I understand it, you can actually binge watch YouTube videos and study for an exam at the same time. I believe that's how it works now, right? <laughs> I mean, I think you've, a you've asked a big question and in some sense a question that, that sort of answers itself, which is we need to do something about this. And it's not just college students, it's all of us. You know, there's been this, this in the last 10 years, this sudden, sudden, you know, wrenching social change, change in the texture of all of our lives that we need to, to come to terms with. And we were talking at dinner like, well, we, we're all complaining about it and nobody does anything about it. Nobody changes because it's really hard. So all, I'm just going to say something very banal, which is, well, you got to try. And you got to recognize, and I say this, you know, in sort of the excellent sheep thing, like if you, don't be, if you stop being a credential accumulator, you're going to have to give some stuff up. You might not get the job at Goldman. Just realize you're already giving something up. You're already giving something up. So it's not a choice to give something up by quitting social media. It's a choice of which thing you're going to give up. Uh, and it just, it's hard. And it's probably going to be an ongoing sort of addiction management thing. That's all I, that's all I can say. <laughs>